Uh, good afternoon, church. It is so good to be here with all of you. Uh, today we are beginning our first uh, sermon on our sermon series through the book of Philippians. And I, what I want to do is before we, we're going to be looking at the first 11 verses today, especially diving into verses 9, 10, and 11. But before we do that, I want to give all of us just a little bit of context about this city, Philippi, and and the letter that Paul is writing to the Philippians, right? Because oftentimes we just, you know, it's just a title to us. We don't have any sort of other connection to what this place is. So if we can go to the next slide, Uh, the city of Philippi is found kind of in northern Greece, very close to Turkey. Some say it's the first you know, city that Paul visited on the European continent, depending where you slice Asia and Europe. Uh, If we go to the next slide, we see that there's, they actually found the city uh, archaeologically. There's a big mountain that it's next to, the one on the right, that's an amphitheater, and then there's the market, kind of the main center of the city. So there you go. So just, just want you to have a visual of where Paul is writing to, because Paul actually uh, went there uh, in person. Now, the city of Philippi was founded in around 300-something B.C., and it was shortly thereafter conquered by Alexander the Great's father, King Philip II, and you named it, uh, you guessed it, he renamed the city after his own self. Big surprise, right? Uh, And it was at the time that Paul was writing to the Philippians, uh, Philippi was actually a very important, it was one of the leading cities in that district at that time. It was very strategic for trade, for military purposes, and so, and there was actually a lot of gold mines in that area, and therefore it was a very wealthy city. Now, I want to give a little pop quiz for you. When we read Acts, we read Paul and, and his companions going into from city to city on his missionary trip. Where would they go in the city whenever they would go into the city? The synagogue, right? The synagogue, because they knew there would be a gathering of people ready to hear the news about Jesus. Well, when we read Acts, specifically Acts 16, we never see that Paul goes to a synagogue in the city of Philippi, which tells us that there probably wasn't a huge concentration of Jewish, uh, Jewish people there. So they just went kind of a, a place of prayer. Now, interestingly enough, the, the, again, the context of the city of Philippi, Paul comes into there. He starts going around preaching, you know, doing God's work, and this girl who the Word of God says had an evil spirit living in her, a spirit that was used for fortune-telling, right? And this evil spirit, this little girl started following them around everywhere for days, crying out, these are the servants of the Most High God. These are the servants of the Most High God, and just yelling that for days. After a couple of days, Paul got really irritated. I'm surprised it took him that long, right? Uh, probably an hour. I would have been done by then. But it, he, he, he had enough, and so by the power of God, he actually cast out that demon out of that little girl. She was healed. But what happened was the masters who owned that slave girl, they were not happy because now they can't profit off of her fortune telling. So they actually, they capture him, they beat him, and they throw him into prison, right? So all because he helped somebody. So now Paul is in prison. Paul and Silas, they're in prison uh, just completely unjustly, and they're sitting there, they're, they're singing hymns in the middle of the night, and God sends an earthquake, And the earthquake actually opens up all the cells of the prison, but because of Paul, none of the prisoners escape. When the master of the prison, the one that's in charge of it, runs into the prison and sees all the cells open, he's assuming everybody ran out. And so he pulls out the sword ready to kill his own self because in Rome there was a law that if your prisoner escaped, you had to die. So he was certain he was going to be executed, so he might as well do it now. Paul cries out, says, don't hurt yourself. We are all still here. And he comes in trembling with light, comes in, and he hears the gospel. And not only is his body saved, but his soul is saved. And the soul, uh, souls of his entire family, they all believe we read, and they all come to the Lord. This is the city of Philippi. And what's funny is now Paul 
He's not in Philippi writing to the Philippians. He's in Rome writing to the Philippians. And while he's in Rome, you guessed it, he's also in prison. So, there's a, you know, it's just prison. It's a, Paul, Paul was a, you know, he was a prisoner. He did this for the Lord. And he's writing this letter, and it's, it's almost at the very end of Paul's life. He didn't know when he was going to die. But is, th- these are one of his last letters that he wrote and it's a very rich letter. It's got so many different themes. It's got joy, as you will see in the beginning, as we'll read it. You can see joy, and, and, and Paul's just bursting with joy. Uh, again, it's, it's ironic because he's in prison, right? He's old, he's going through pain, and yet he's rejoicing, and he's encouraging the Philippians to rejoice. It talks about unity. It talks about humility. It talks about the Christ-centered life, which we'll talk about in two weeks It talks about partnering for the gospel. It talks about spiritual growth. And lastly, another big theme is God's provision, how God provides and gives us what we need when we need it. So, if you can, open up your Bibles, and we're going to read the first 11 verses, Philippians chapter 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. Let's stop right there. Paul's opening up this letter, and he's talking about how much he loves them. You could see Paul's affection for the Philippians. He's got a special bond to them. Verse 3, he's thanking God for them. He's saying, look, and by the way, it's biblical to tell other people, hey, I'm thanking God for you. Hey, I'm praying for you, because this is what Paul did, right? He told other people, hey, I'm praying for you. It's not a, you're not showing off that you're praying. It's, it encourages people, right? I'm praying for you. Verse 4, we see that he's praying with joy, specifically because verse 5, he says that they partnered with him in the gospel. They were helping spread the gospel with Paul. We see that the Philippian church was a church that took the great commission of Jesus Christ very seriously to go and make disciples of all nations. In verse 6, Paul expresses certainty that God will finish the good work that he started in them. He says, I know God started a good work and he will finish it He's starting the letter off really strong. Verse 7 and 8, we, he talks about how happy he is with them again and how much he loves them. And again, because they partnered with him. They supported him in his imprisonment and they supported him to spread the gospel to the whole world. And now we're going to get into verses 9 through 11 and we're going to spend the rest of our time here. So let's read together. Verse 9, and it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This verse verse 9, it's very easy, like, to just kind of gloss over this verse and not catch the depth that is going on here. He says, in my prayer that your love may abound more and more with all, with knowledge and all discernment. He's praying that they would become more and more loving, and he adds a clause to it, says specifically with knowledge and all discernment. Naturally, we as people, we are either good at one or the other, Right? We might be really good at love, give, help, serve, be generous, 
Or we might be really good at discernment, right? Uh, we could see when people are trying to be manipulative. We understand people, uh, and we, we want to protect our families, our, our loved ones, our friends, right? We identify risk, and we say, hey, that's a dangerous person, and so we're good at discernment. Another way of describing this phenomenon is head and heart. Heart is the love, head is the discernment. But what's interesting, what we see here in verse 9, the prayer that Paul is praying for the Philippians, what he's desiring for them is that they wouldn't pick one, but that they would have both. They would have love and discernment. Yes, church, love is the greatest. Amen? Why? Because God Himself is love. Like, that's His essence. But the Bible doesn't want us to just stop with love. In fact, we see Jesus think the same way and speak the same way. Matthew 10, 16 says, Jesus tells His disciples, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Again, we see head and heart come together in one, even according to Jesus. So, Let's talk about for those of us for whom love, it's tempting to love without discernment. We might think, you know, my job is to just love and God will take care of the rest and everything will be okay. And you're right. Love is the most important thing. Amen and amen. And, and if I had to pick one, if I had to be wrong with, in one, I would rather err on the side of love than err on the side of discernment. But again, Scripture tells us that our love should not be blind. It should abound with knowledge and discernment. You see, the problem with blind love, church, is that blind love can be wasteful. I'll give you a personal example. I remember when we just got married, and my wife had this, like, old phone, right? And it's just like, glitching, and it's just like not loading, and there's all these bugs, and, and I, I, it would drive me crazier than it would drive her, right? And I, you know, I grew up with technology and computers and all that, and so I understand technology. I like technology, and so I'm like, oh, man, you know what? You know what would be really meaningful to her? I'm going to save up money. I'm going to secretly save up some money, and I'm going to buy her like the best phone out there with the latest and greatest features, and it's going to work very smoothly. You know, I can already imagine how like happy she's going to be when she's going to see it. So I buy this phone, and I come, and I forgot what it was, like her birthday or some other holiday. I'm like, hey, babe, and she's like doing something in the kitchen. I've got, a, I've got something for a little surprise, you know? She's like, oh, what is it? And I, and I pull it out and I show her and I'm like, look at all these cool things. And I'm, and I'm showing her all these features and she like looks at it, she's like, oh, thank you so much. You know, she just like sets it aside and just keeps doing whatever she's doing. And that was not at all the reaction I was expecting. I was expecting her to just be so elated, so happy and just almost, you know, pass out from joy. And that was not the case whatsoever. Later in my marriage did I realize that gifts aren't really like her love language, uh, and technology is not really like she doesn't get excited about that. What she really cares about is me spending quality time with her. It's me helping her around the house. That's what really communicates love to her. That's the most meaningful thing. So I could have the best intentions in my heart. I could spend lots and lots of money. I could get into debt buying something super expensive for her, but for her, it's not going to have as big of an impact as just simply spending, you know, even a few days with her of quality time because that's just, that, that doesn't resonate with her. So blind love can be wasteful. Donating money to places that we don't know anything about, just, oh, you know, you need money, okay. Without, oftentimes, we, maybe we do it without even praying about it. It's blind love. You know, uh, a few years ago, I got a text 
from one of my relatives, like, oh, please pray. There's 22 Christians that are about to be executed tomorrow at 1 p.m. local time in this one Muslim country or something like that. And, and uh, you know, I'm reading, I'm like, please send this text message to others so they can pray. I'm like, oh, man, I can't believe this is happening. And I'm about to, like, click send to other people, you know, let other people know, let more people in the church know. I'm like, hold on, let me, let me just type this into Google, right? So I go, and I type it into Google, and lo and behold, it's the same exact 22 Christians, the same exact city about to be executed for the last eight years, right? It's this, it's this like spam that just keeps going around for years and years and Christians just out of our love for these people are just spreading this, this text, this Facebook post like a virus, right? And it's just going around and think about how much, how much prayer went into for these people that don't even exist. How much prayer and time and emotion and energy and you know, prayers that services blind love can be wasteful and actually distract us from loving in ways that is actually impactful. In a way that makes a real difference in the lives of people. Blind love can be not just wasteful, blind love can actually be harmful. Very simple example, children, right? For those of us who might be parents or uncles and aunts, we love these little kids, right? And, and their smile is everything to us, right? But we understand we can't just keep giving them everything that makes them smile in the moment, right? Because if we would, all they would be eating is candy all the time. Like that would be their food pyramid, which is a big piece of candy, right? And, and they would just be watching cartoons from the moment they wake up until they pass out in the evening. And we understand that the, too much of these good things will not be a blessing to them, but that's blind love. Well, that makes you happy. That makes you smile, right? So I'm going to give it to you. could actually be harmful. And lastly, blind love. Love can actually be intentionally blind. You know, there's that saying, ignorance is what, church? Bliss, right? We all, we, we love that saying, right? We live by that saying, ignorance is bliss, this is often the world's only solution when it comes to loving people. I don't want to know too much about you. I don't want to get too close to you because I still want to like you. I'm not even love you. I just want to like you. So I don't want to get even, I don't want to know you and your drama and your problems. I just, I just want to smile at you. I just want to, you know, boom, oh, we're good. And that's it, right? Ignorance is Bliss. It's easy to donate to some poor child in a third world country and just forget about that. By the way, that's a good thing. But, you know, if we really want to be really loving to that person, well, you move and you live and you help that person, well, all of a sudden you're going to realize all these other non-cute things about this person. That child's going to sin against you, might steal things from you, and do all these horrible things to you, and you realize, like, why am I even supporting this person, Right? And so oftentimes the world chooses to just close their eyes, to live in ignorance and naivete, because we know that if we find out more, it will be impossible to love. So for some of us, it is tempting to love without discernment. For the rest of us, it's tempting to be discerning and oftentimes without love. Perhaps God has given you a gift in being discerning, right? You know and understand people you see, you, and you understand people's oftentimes selfish and, and sinful nature. You understand the risks that come from people, even from other Christians, right? You understand that all people fail and could fail and could fail you, right? So you protect yourself. You understand that in almost everything that all people do, there's at least a little bit of a selfish motive and I wouldn't say that this view is actually a departure from reality. Even Jesus looked at people this way, right? John 2, 24, but Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. Notice it doesn't say he didn't knew the Pharisees or his enemies. He knew all people, meaning us. 
and he needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Jesus was not naive about what lives in our hearts. So the problem is, the more we learn about people, the harder it becomes to love them. As the popular saying goes, the more people I meet, the more I appreciate my dog, right? It's true in a sense. I remember in 2009, I uh, went on a missionary trip to another country, and we were helping that, the local church there build their own church building. And things were going well, it was busy and underway, and the plumber comes up to me and he says, hey, Peter, we, we want to connect the house to the city sewer. And so in order to do that, we need to dig a trench. I'm like, okay, I, I can help that way. Uh, that would have been easy if it was just like dirt. It would have been easy if it was just like soft clay, right? It was not that at all. It was like rock, like a bunch of rocks with, with dirt that almost like cemented those rocks in, right? I had to use a pickaxe. I had to use a shovel just to break it up and then take it out. It was very hard work. So I decided, I'm like, you know, I'm going to recruit someone to help me so I can finish by the end of the day, right? And so I seen a guy from the local church uh, that was about my age. I, you know, kind of ex- talked to him in whatever way I could. I said, hey, I need your help. You know, he's like, okay, okay. So he starts, you know, digging. We're digging. I turn around. You know, five minutes later, I turn around. And he's standing. He's talking to someone else. I'm like, hey, my friend, like, come dig with us, you know, like, help me out. He's like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So he goes, and he's digging, you know. Five minutes later, oh, I need to go to the bathroom, you know, and just leaves for like another 20 minutes, comes like strolling around to him like, hey, keep helping me, you know. So, oh, five minutes later, he needs to go eat. He needs to do this or that. And after about four or five tries, I'm like, okay, I'm done. I'm, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to just do it myself, you know. I'll be honest. In that moment, when I had gotten to know who he is, it was hard for me to love that guy, right? It was hard for my heart to love him. Because I'm thinking like, dude, we came here for you. We're doing this for you. We're trying to help you. Not me, not us, you. So at least have like the common decency to to pretend to help or at least help while we're here. And I understand he wasn't representing the entire church there, but what I learned about him that day made it really difficult for me to love him. And so sometimes what we do is instead of continuing in ignorance, instead of closing our eyes, we decide to just close our hearts towards people. And we have very little love left in our heart when we understand who these people really are and what they're all about It's difficult for us to get past what we know about these people, right? And yet, church, God clearly tells us He wants our love to abound. Not just stay where it's at, not just get less, but abound, grow more and more with knowledge and all discernment. Not just love without knowledge, not just discernment without love, but both. And I know it might seem impossible, and we'll talk about that in a second. But continuing, verse 10. So we're supposed to do all of that so that, follow the logic of Scripture, we do all that, we abound in our love with knowledge and all discernment, so that, for the purpose of, so that you may approve what is excellent. This Greek word behind approve oftentimes means um, test, discover, And by implication, that's why some will translate it as approve what is excellent. It's like saying, hey, this new pizza place opened up. Go check it out, right? You're going to love it. So that's what Paul is saying. When we we love with discernment, we will discover, we will approve of what is excellent because we are not meant to stay in either extreme. Blind love. That's not excellent. There's a better way, right? Cynical knowledge of people. Ah, people are all like this. That's not excellent. There's a better way. And by combining both love and discernment, we discover, we approve of what is excellent, what is best. It's like combining our head and our heart together 
is like two wings of a plane, right? A plane can't fly with just one wing, right? It's just going to go in circles. But when you have both love and discernment, then the plane can fly. It can go places. And the Bible tells us when we have both, we will discover what is excellent because Remember, remember that passage I read about Jesus? He knew what was in people's hearts, and yet, like, we can't get stuck on that verse. We can't just stay there and say, well, I'm just like Jesus. I know what's in people. I don't trust people. I don't like people. But Jesus didn't stay there. Yes, Jesus knew what was in all of our hearts, and yet, He still loved us, and He still died for us. That's the paradox, right? Right? And look at what happens next, verse 10. And so, be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. When we love with head and heart, we will be holy. In other words, we will be prepared for the day when Jesus comes back. The internal state of our soul will be correct in the eyes of God. And not just that, going on, verse 11 says, filled with the fruit of righteousness. Living with head and heart, we will be filled with the fruit of righteousness. Our life will be filled with this fruit. You see, if righteousness is a tree, then the fruit that it gives off is what, church? What does righteousness produce? Good works, right? That's the fruit of righteousness. And notice, it doesn't just say just a little bit, like it's this big tree and there's like three apples. No, it says filled, meaning a lot. It is filled with, overflowing. So, loving with head and heart, with love and discernment, we will both be holy and, and our internal state will be right before God, and our external results will also bear fruit. And I didn't say this at the Russian service, but I'll say it here. Oftentimes, as churches, all churches, we like to emphasize one or the other, Right? It's, it's, you know, you're going to get lots of deep theology, deep study of the Bible, and, and you're going to get clarity and precision down to the iota, but very little practical help from those churches, right? That's wrong. That's not complete. But then in other churches, you're going to have so much help and serving and, and social impact and all these good things, but oftentimes... It is missing a deep knowledge of our God, a deep personal knowledge. Personal holiness is ignored. That too, church, is wrong and incomplete. It's natural for us to fall into these pits, but we have to, we have to climb out and go towards Christ. We need both. So, all that being said, I want to highlight something very important before we finish. Verse 11, it says, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. Meaning our good deeds are a, resu- are a result of the righteousness that we have. And notice, the righteousness, it's not ours, church. It doesn't belong to us. This is the key here, right? And Paul makes this even clear just two chapters over. Philippians 3, 9, not having a righteousness of my own, that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. When we have the righteousness of Jesus Christ himself, we can produce the good works that are actually pleasing to God. Again, a righteousness that depends on faith, not on works, This is the gospel, church. We can never please God by our own good works. We can't. We cannot do that. On our own, we can never love people the way we actually ought to. We cannot, especially when we know who they really are. I know what you've done. I know who you are. I know what you could do to me. Without faith, without the righteousness of Jesus Christ, we've only got two options. You close your eyes and you try to love as best as you can, or you keep your eyes open, but you're not loving anyone. 
But when we trust in Jesus, that he has forgiven me all of my sin, that, that he didn't start loving me after my good deeds, but before my good deeds, before I even promised him that I would do something good, he already loved me and died for me. When I trust in that, then I can love people before they did anything to me or even promised to do, good, any, to do anything good to me. If I trust that God has loved me when I was a sinner, then I too can begin to learn to love other sinners that maybe just want to use me. When I understand that God has forgiven me knowing who I really am. God knows me better than I know anyone else. That in God's eyes, I was worse, a worse sinner than any other sinner I know. Then I can begin to love sinners. When I trust Jesus, I can love people who are trying to hurt me because Jesus loved people who tried to hurt him and did hurt him. Jesus understood how evil and selfish every single one of us are, and yet he still died for us. His love covers over all of it. He died for those who crucified him. Church, I just want to tell you, we do not have this power within our own hearts. We don't. You're never going to find it if all you do is you are searching within yourself to love others when you know who they really are. Our natural selfish love needs ignorance in order to exist. As soon as there's no ignorance, it just evaporates. But in Jesus, we find a third way. Only by faith in Jesus can our head and our heart be brought back together because sin fractures them. And, and they, don't, they no longer cooperate. They fight one another and one will dominate the other. But in Christ, we can be healed and made whole and we can begin to love with discernment. Dear friend, if you are struggling to love people, like actually love people, and you know that if that's true in your heart. If you're struggling to do the good deeds, to bear that fruit of righteousness, I want to tell you, you need the righteousness of Christ, not your own. You need the righteousness of the perfect Son of God. And you need to start by getting your relationship with God right first. And that only comes by trusting Him, because trust is the foundation of any relationship, right? If we don't trust one another, there is no relationship. God wants to have a relationship with you, but that can only happen if you trust Him. With what, you might ask? With everything. The almighty, all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving God wants your entire life. He wants everything. He's not content with 90%, 99%, but he wants all 100. And he will take care of you when you trust in him. So I urge you, leave behind your sins. Look to Jesus. Cling to Jesus. Cast yourself fully upon him. Hold nothing back. No backup plans. No plan B, C, D, E, F, G. Nothing. Jesus is your plan A, and that's it. Jesus is your plan A to Z, your alpha and omega, right? And so, all of this, all of this, abounding in love with knowledge and all discernment, approving what is excellent, being pure and blameless in the day of Christ, being filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, all of this that we just talked about, all of this is supposed to be to the glory and praise of God. So as I call the band up, I want to finish on this last phrase right here, to the glory and praise of God. This is the goal. This is the, the aim, right? The, the goal of unifying our hearts and our minds in Christ so that God could be glorified and praised through us. Church, all things exist for the glory of God. 
the glory of God is the epicenter of all existence, of all that is. Anything you can imagine or think of, all of it ultimately exists for the glory of the Creator Most High God. And when the center of my personal solar system is the glory of God, then I will be able to love with knowledge and all discernment. Because you see, if the glory of God is not the purpose of my love, if that's not the driving force of my love, if that's not the purpose of my knowledge, if that's not the purpose of my discernment, we won't be able to be truly loving, right? If we want to be loving apart from glorifying God, if that's not the main goal, then who are we trying to glorify? Who's sitting at the center if it's not God? Us. Me, right? It's to show how loving I am. It's to show what a good person I am. Maybe it's even just to show it to me, not even to other people. I just want to prove to myself that I'm good. I'm still sitting at the center of the universe instead of the glory of God. And we cannot be truly loving if we are at the center. If my goal is to prove my own self, and the world's really good at this. There are so many nonprofits. Truly, they're not in it for the money. They're in it for something else. They want to just show how good they are. They want to feel good about themselves. There are people who don't have the glory of God at the center of their lives give billions of dollars every year, if you count it all up, billions of dollars, and yet the glory of God is not at the center of it. They are at the center of it. May the Lord bless us, church, as we go out into this world to truly love, not with blind love, not with cynical knowledge, but love with knowledge and all discernment. And may we do it all for the glory of God. Amen? Let's stand. We're going to pray. I'm going to give you just a minute of response time. Pray through what the Spirit is putting on your heart. And I'll pray in conclusion. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would give us that real love for people. Not one that leans on ignorance and closes its eyes and is blind. And not just discernment, cold discernment, cynicism. Lord, but a true, a hot love that is rational, that understands, that seeks what is excellent. Help us, Lord. And I pray that your glory would be at the center of it all, of each of our lives, Lord. And for anyone who has not come to know who you really are yet, save them. May they know you. May they love you. Lord, we thank you. We thank you. And with Paul, we pray with joy, God, because you have made all of this possible. And in you, Jesus, we have that righteousness that can produce that real kind of love. Lord, we thank you, we worship you, and we long for the day to see you face to face. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.